Uh, so I sewed the Olympic flags of all the European nations when I was about 15 years old. Such a nerdy thing to do. Even if you don't end up traveling, you dream about other parts of the world. Word, that phrase, lifetime traveler, is always changing. Mm -hmm. So 20 years ago, it meant that I didn't come back to the United States at all for a year. Sometimes it's nice to sit on a hill and watch the world go by. You know? that's, that's, a, that's an important part of human experience too, and we forget that sometimes. After publishing his best-selling book, Vagabonding, in 2002, Rolf Potts became known as the Jack Kerouac of the internet age. He's inspired countless people around the world, including Tim Ferriss, who credits Rolf's book as the inspiration behind his travels leading up to the four-hour work week. I first learned about Rolf's work through Tim Ferriss's book in 2007, and these concepts have stayed with me ever since. Few people know, however, that every summer, Rolf teaches a Paris writing workshop here in the City of Light, and although I've never been able to attend before, when Rolf announced a one-week travel memoir writing course this year, I jumped at the chance to come to Paris and learn how to write about travel from one of my favorite authors. In between writing and sightseeing, Rolf took the time to sit down with me the other day and talk with us about the motivation behind the original Vagabonding book and what he's learned after traveling around the world for more than 20 years. Let's see what he has to say. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Badass Digital Nomads. And today we are here with an OG digital nomad who was one before we were calling ourselves digital nomads. And this is Rolf Potts of Vagabonding fame. So if you guys have ever heard of the book Vagabonding or the four hour work week, here is the author. <laughs> so welcome, Rolf. Thank you. Good to be talking to you here in Paris, France. Yes. So actually, I am in Rolf's travel memoir writing workshop. So that is why we're hanging out here in Paris today. And he was kind enough to come on the show and talk a little bit about, well, he's been traveling around the world for more than two decades now. Yes. It's the 20th anniversary of my first big international vagabonding journey. So it's a fun year. For me. Time flies. Time flies. It's been 25 years since my first vagabonding journey, if you count my van trip around North America in 1994. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were doing van life before hashtag van life. Totally. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I actually did a podcast um, for my own podcast, Deviate. I interviewed the friend that I took that trip with. And um, not only was it before hashtag, it was before anybody used the dial-up internet. So it was totally... OG fan life. And, and it was great. It, it was really a terrific trip for all the reasons people like hashtag van life. Yeah. Without being able to document it on social media, but it's probably a pure form of, of traveling back then. It was, I was, I was reading my journals and I don't want to criticize the compulsion to put things on social media because if it existed back then I probably would have, but there were just some really beautiful moments that I'm glad that just existed for me and my friends who shared them. You know? Yeah. And what were you in school at that time? No, I had just graduated. Okay. I worked as a landscaper and this is, I write about this in Vagabond and I worked as a landscaper for eight months in Seattle, saved my money. It's funny. I traveled America for eight months for $5,000 and lived in a van with, with uh, a friend and various combinations of friends and just had this most amazing trip. And it's funny how I've been traveling the world for a long time now, but you can only travel the world when you're 23, year old, 23 years yeah. old once. So even though I've had more exotic travels since then, it's hard to compare to your first vagabonding trip. Just the great, the gratitude and the excitement is so strong. And I recently reread my journal and it's just, it's just really amazing that even without Instagram or social media, I was really um, channeling my soul into that trip. And it was just terrific. I would love to actually, I really wanted to ask you about, um, you were wrote in vagabonding that you thought that this was kind of a term that you stumbled upon through doing it, mm -hmm. um, and trying to define what it was that you were doing. Like what was this idea to just kind of travel perpetually and live that kind of nomadic lifestyle before there was a term to really describe it. So 
what do you think, uh, we also talked a little bit in the workshop about um, how you liked the Olympics and you, did you collect the Olympic flags or you drew the Olympic flags? Yeah, well, I was taking home ec class. I don't even know if they have, still have home ec class. So I sewed the Olympic flags of all the European nations when I was about 13 years old. Such a nerdy thing to do, but uh, it's great. I have them hanging on my wall now. That's amazing. And see, I always, um, geography was my favorite subject in school. So I memorized the whole entire world map before okay. I ever even had a passport. Right. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on this like innate desire to travel because it's something that uh, all humans share in common even before we have the words to really define what it is and what it means. So where do you think after having circled the globe so many times and of course we have the history of nomadic tribes and things like that, but why do you think that that desire is so strong even though your parents didn't travel that much or expose you to that aspect of the world? I think it just is an innate curiosity and desire. Even if you don't end up traveling, you dream about other parts of the world. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's hardwired. It might be hardwired into humans because we've been nomadic for more centuries and millennia than we haven't been. Yeah. And so the idea that for years, you know, thousands of years ago, to, to find opportunities and to enhance your life, you had to be on the move. You know, you had to be following the herds you were hunting or the seasons of the fruit trees or, or whatever. Um, and so I think even though it's easy to look on childhood as this time of imagination, and it is, uh, I think there's a reason why as little kids we dream about travel, we dream about wild animals, you know, we dream about growing up because it's, those are innate human instincts. Yeah, I think so too. I think we're, we're hardwired for it, for sure. Both you and I started traveling in the 90s and the early 2000s before, as we mentioned, before social media, before there was so much technology and Google Maps and making things easier. Um, do you feel like back then, like what was the kind of resistance that you were getting from people, from your friends, from your family members? And why do you think that people still struggle with taking this decision today? Because Back then, even like a few decades ago, it wasn't generally accepted to be able to vagabond or travel and work remotely. And these weren't concepts that were mainstream and they still aren't quite mainstream today. But now there's your book. There's the four hour work week. There's so many travel books and um, with social media, there's so much documentation on how people can do it. So what do you think is still holding people back from that? And do you think that the same things that people, um, the same resistance that you came up on in the nineties and the two thousands, do you think that still exists today? I think a version of it still exists. Uh, you know, a big thing in the nineties and even before the nineties of people I've talked to is just, it was seen as long-term travel was seen as this sort of drop out and be a rebel gesture. And one thing that the digital nomad mo movement and just sort of the ubiquity of the internet and our ability to see what other people are doing as travelers has eliminated the mystery and the, the counterculture vibe of long-term world travel. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, being rebellious or countercultural, but there is, as I say in vagabonding, a real common sense um, motivation to this kind of travel. It doesn't need to be expensive. It doesn't need to be dangerous. It doesn't need to be strange or rebellious is just something that you can use to quietly enhance your life. Yet, I think that there are certain types of conservatism that can exist on both ends of the political spectrum that there's this compulsion that somehow you're being irresponsible or dangerous or self-indulgent by traveling. Um, and even, you know, there's some backlash against digital nomads just by saying, oh, those are just, you know, vacuous hipsters who are self-involved, right? Well, it doesn't have to be that way. I'm sure you can find examples of digital nomads who are self-involved and, and, and self-indulgent. But at the end of the day, I still stand by the fact of what I wrote in Vagabonding before any of this happened, that it just makes sense. It's a common sense way of deepening your life in a way that can enhance your life throughout your life 
and it need not be a silly or dangerous thing. You can live a life that's more dangerous at home uh, than, than on the road if you're not careful about it. So practiced thoughtfully, long-term travel makes sense and is very doable, yet people through, through fear or certain compulsions or even certain, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's an argument that community is more cohesive when people are always in a place. My counter argument would be sometimes community needs people who leave and come back and say, this is what it's like on the other side of the world. So I'm probably the, the wrong person to ask for a counter argument to the digital nomad life, to the vagabonding life. And so I'm just going to assert that it's still, the fears are still there. Different iterations of the same, same fears are still there, but the reasons that make travel rewarding are still there too. Yeah, you actually, I wrote, I took a few quotes from your book on that because I have seen them a few times. I think they were maybe in Tools of Titans as well, mm -hmm. where Tim Ferriss was talking about that. And um, you say, well, I paraphrase this one, but that long-term travel is an act of common sense within society, not rebellion. So what you mm -hmm. just said, and that it has always been a private choice within a society that is constantly urging us to do otherwise. And I find that to be so conflicting because, yeah, it is, it is a common sense choice and it is something that can be just a natural part of life and growing up and finding independence and uh, finding connection and common ground with other people around the world. But yet, even in almost 2020, it is still kind of seen as an act of rebellion and people still... Uh, struggle with the perceived or real societal expectations of following a linear path to happiness or to adulthood or whatever that might be, which is always, you know, go to school, get a job, get married, have kids, save money, work hard, and then travel or relax at the end. So why do you think that that myth is still perpetuated? I mean, it does work for some people, but we also know that the rat race can be a bit cyclical with no end in sight, just this infinite feedback loop that if you make it to the end, you can then have fun and go travel. So yeah, why do you think that people are still afraid to step out of that generally accepted way of life and do the rebellious thing of like taking a sabbatical or gap year or whatever to travel younger? Well, I think that linear way of thinking, there's a reason why we have a linear way of thinking because it, it creates stability, you know, that's under some paradigms, being a flaky person who changes their mind about how to live every six months is not going to live a very stable life. They're not going to be good parents. They're not going to be good employees. But I think sometimes we don't think holistically about what makes us happy and what the best course of action is. And I think one thing that I haven't mentioned that I probably should, that there, there's this idea of advertising. There's this idea of consume, 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 buy, buy, buy. More things will make you happy type thing. Mm -hmm. And that actually, that creates employment, I guess. But you don't have to buy into that. I think it's, it's not a healthy attitude that you can buy your happiness by having the newest brand of jeans or the newest kind of car or whatever. And I think one argument against long-term travel is, oh, you have to be rich to do it, when that's not true at all. You just don't buy the goddamn jeans. Sorry if I'm swearing. Yeah, no, um, you just don't buy the jeans. You don't buy the car. You actually spend money not by what is dictated by advertisers, but in your own self-interest. Because why not just drive a normal, ugly car and then spend six months on the other side of the world, then always have the newest car and impress half a dozen people who will forget about it the next week. And so I think there's this societal compulsion that is underscored by things like advertising that isn't very thoughtful. Um, and so I think one thing that underpins something like vagabonding is the idea that really think about what you want in life. Think about how you want to spend your time. I talk a lot about time wealth. And some people say, well, some people don't want to travel. And it's like, well, yeah, use your time well to spend time with your family or to spend time playing World of Warcraft or whatever makes you happy, you know. Yeah. But we don't 
we aren't often encouraged to be make ourselves rich in time. That often we are encouraged to have the fanciest car or the fanciest jeans, when in fact, how we live our days is how we spend our time. And um, so, so that's the secret. And it's different for everyone. But I really think that being thoughtful about how your life is lived is at the core of this argument. And it's the best counter argument against a lot of the anti-travel attitudes that can come up. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Just making that whatever the decision is that makes you happy, just being confident in doing that, even if you don't get external validation or approval from any specific source, just being comfortable in that decision, like, okay, that's right for me to do, so I'm gonna do it. Or I wanna work 20 hours a week so I can play video games and pick my kid up from school or whatever the reason is. And like, any reason is good, any reason is okay. And without being apologetic about it. So permission to act lawfully. <laughs> well, one thing about time wealth too is that, sir, sure, there's certain people who may judge you for having uncool jeans or a, the, the, not the best car in the world, but there is actually a community, an ever-growing community of people who do value time wealth, you know? Yeah. And those are the kinds of people that maybe you could turn to for validation instead of the, the consume, 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 buy, buy, buy people, so. Yeah, and how... Um after so many years and then kind of not caring what people think and traveling and coming back and forth to the U.S., how is it coming home or where do you see as your home now? Is it, is it the U.S. or do you think that going back and forth has been a detriment because you kind of eschewed that uh, normal American lifestyle? Do you feel like you still fit in? You know, I fit in on my own terms, and my life has been different. And I think everybody's, everybody's vagabonding lifestyle is different, you know. I traveled America 25 years ago with my friend Jeff, who's now married, works for Microsoft, and has three kids. And sometimes, even though I've traveled around the world God knows how many times in those 25 years, sometimes I envy his good middle American family life. And that's, that's good to acknowledge that it's not a contest, that... People who live vagabonding lifestyle or are digital nomads, they're not winning a contest against somebody else. You're just trying to manifest a fuller version of yourself. And so for a long time, I really had no home apart from occasional residency hotels and couches. Eventually, 14 years ago, I got some land in Kansas, which is my home state. It's very near my family, who I'm close to. And one thing I learned from travel is that family is, a, is something that's valued everywhere. And then in places, even in, even especially in poor places, families will pool their resources to live, to help each other and live close together. So my neighbors, my next door neighbors are my parents and my sister and her family lives a mile and a half away. And I've, it's been fun to be a part of my nephew's life, a part of my parents' life when I'm not traveling. And so, and then also there's the advantage that Kansas is a super cheap place to live. You know, it's not a super sexy place to live, but it's an inexpensive place to live. And my travel has really been enabled by the fact that I, not that I'm making millions of dollars every year, but I'm just spending money on what makes me happy in places that make me happy. And fortunately, my home is a place where one can live very simply and very inexpensively in a way that allows me to be more extravagant with my travels during other times of the year. Yeah, I think that's another example of time wealth, actually. Right. Um, Tim Urban of that Wait But Why blog talks a lot about how much time you have left with your friends, family, parents, siblings when you get to be a certain age. So I know that's one of the things that I've taken advantage of being nomadic most of the time is being able to spend big chunks of time near family. So that's a choice as well. And also that people don't have to be vagabonding forever. You know, they could do it for a few months, even if you did it for three months out of your life, that would be amazing. Like that would be a life changing experience, even one, one month. So it's like being able to vagabond for more than just going on vacation and then coming back or going back and forth. I mean, do you see yourself as always like a lifetime traveler? Yes, but that word, that phrase, lifetime traveler, is always changing. Mm -hmm. So 20 years ago, it meant that I didn't come back to the United States at all for a year. These days, it means that maybe I'm traveling half the year. And some years, I travel less than half the year. Sometimes I travel more than half the year. 
but it just becomes a dynamic part of my identity. Again, there's sometimes this zero sum thinking that's like, well, I travel 10 months a year. And it's like, well, good for you. But some years I don't feel like traveling 10 yeah. months a year. And I have different interests and pursuits and relationships that dictate my decisions. It's not some arbitrary contest to win the game of travel because once you start seeing travel as a contest, you've lost the point because it's about life enhancement. And I think the more you travel, the more you learn things, you get older, you have a different relationship with family and friends. And so I think it's good to start by being thoughtful and remain being thoughtful because again, once you're being beholden to external pressures, oh, I need to be a super traveler. Well, do you, you know, or do you want to live close to your family a few months a year, or do you want to indulge certain hobbies a certain time of year? So I think constantly reassessing your motivations and knowing that life changes as you get older and that change is inevitable is good to keep in mind. I want to give, before we run out of time, just a few quick, uh, I guess, lightning round sort of questions to fit in for some people who uh, are only able to travel occasionally, maybe like once a year or twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, both of us are huge proponents of slow travel. So in a time of travel hacks and shortcuts, why should people take the slow route, even if they're just going on vacation for one week or two weeks? Can you t just... T speak to the difference in doing the sightseeing circle versus having a smaller itinerary but going slower? Well, one special thing about travel is that it's you're away from home. And I think sometimes this micromanaged do 20 things in one day attitude, it's how we, we are at work. It's how we optimize for efficiency at home. And part of the joy of travel is that you're not at home. You're not beholden to any of that, that you can go to a place and smell it and live slowly and let the day happen and watch the sunset. And I think there's nothing wrong with optimizing your vacation for efficiency and checking 20 things off your list. But I think it's just gonna be more memorable, apart from your bucket list comparisons, it's gonna be more memorable and more life affecting if you travel in a way that is different from how you live at home, if you enjoy days, if you, if you just walk around a city and see what interests you rather than checking things off of a list. Um, because for better or for worse, a lot of list-driven tourism is an extension of how we live at home. And then suddenly we're taking selfies in front of this place and, and we're sort of performing our travels for the audience back home. We're not really thinking about what makes us happy and, and what will really make us experience a place on our own terms. So I think using the five senses, taking things slow, um, being a little lazy sometimes, being counterintuitive and just walking until your day becomes interesting are, are great things to keep in mind as really great options when you're traveling. I completely agree. And I have memories of like traveling with my parents and going so many places so fast that we skipped meals and I would have to call mutiny at some point and just say, I'm going to sit on this hill and people watch for a few hours and you guys go to... 13 more churches in the next hour and I'll just wait till you're done. So. Yeah. And, and, and not to disparage the people who want to see 13 churches, but sometimes it's nice to sit on a hill and, and watch the world go by, you yeah. know, that's, that's a, that's an important part of human experience too. And we forget that sometimes. And also people feel like once they um, like to travel authentically, that they can't have a tour guide or you know, they have to do everything on their own. So can you also speak to how, even after traveling for decades, how you might still hire a guide to see a new place and why that's important and why that gives you an extra layer of, of perspective on that location? Yeah, well, it gives you variety and a new kind of knowledge and it helps you understand even how people who travel with guides all the time travel. I mean, I think sometimes people say, well, I'd, I'd never go to the Eiffel Tower in Paris because that's where the tourists go. Well, just imagine how many people, maybe they're in their 60s and it's their first time in France and this is the most amazing day of their life and you're being snotty because you've already been to Paris and you've already seen the Eiffel Tower. So I think you have to keep in mind that it's not a hierarchical thing and I'm, I personally believe that traveling without a guide is often more rewarding, but 
For example, we're here for a writing class and I hired one of my former students who's a tour guide in Paris to take us around on Friday because I think that'll be a new perspective. He has a skill set and a bunch of knowledge and his own sort of charm and charisma that's going to make that day special for us. This winter I was in Sumatra. I went to the Mentawai Islands and I hired a trekking guide because I don't speak Mentawai. You know, you have to slog through the jungle. And he was the most amazing guy I met in Sumatra. He just was very westernized. He spoke good English, but he was also completely into the Mentawai culture. And he was a Mentawai person who just happened to be modern. And my experience of that sort of semi-Stone Age tribal culture on the Mentawai Islands wouldn't have even touched what had happened if I'd tried to go on my own. You know, so sometimes the expertise that a guide can bring you and just the personal passion that a guide can bring you can really make a difference. I mean, I'm going to take that tip because I think at a certain point I just became very self-sufficient and I thought I'll figure it out on my own. But now I have a different perspective too. And I really like what you said that the expectation of the destination robs it of authenticity. And I think anyone can be become guilty of that and just assume that because we've seen a cliche about a place or a stereotype about a place that we know what we're going to get once we get there. Yeah. And sometimes you think, well, damn it, I came all the way to Sumatra and here's a guy wearing blue jeans and talking on a cell phone. It's like, well, why isn't that an authentic thing too? You know, the world is in flux and our, our understanding of authenticity is, is so limited until we actually travel and realize that it's not just postcard vistas and beauty. You know, as I said in class, that sometimes you're the Notre Dame and the first thing you smell is cat pee, right? <laughs> well, that's that's authentic too, you know, yeah. that everywhere we go, there's going to be a mix of exactly what we dreamed about and exactly the opposite of what we dreamed about. But that's what we experience. And that's the gift of travel is getting these surprises that sometimes go beyond your platonic ideal of what you thought the place would be. Yeah, I've definitely had some expectations uh, crushed a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Santorini just being there even during the shoulder season and I had having seen all the photos of the yeah panoramic vistas with no people and then being crunched into the alleys with selfie sticks and getting elbowed in the head and I know you had a photo of a the inside of Versailles with a lot of people and it's like being able to go to those tourist destinations but also straying off the beaten path and kind of managing that because I just saw a quote about or some stats about uh, King's Landing in Croatia mm. that because of Game of Thrones it's such a popular destination that the max capacity is 8,000 people and they had up to like 135,000 people allegedly yeah. in the same time and then we also discussed how uh, Kopiti Le the beach was closed due to over tourism so mm any tips for for people who want to get off the beaten path well we live when i first started traveling there wasn't a concept of a bucket list i mean there was an equivalent concept of a bucket list but now that's a thing and i don't have a problem with bucket lists but you have to remember the bucket list is what gets you out the door mm -hmm. because when you show up at the bucket list place like versailles like machu picchu like dubrovnik from game of thrones it's going to be full of a bunch of people who are exactly like you, who are, who are just there to check it off their bucket list and are pissed off because you're there, right? And so I think it's good to remember that walk 10 minutes in any direction from a bucket list destination and you're going to find a more air quotes authentic version of what you had hoped to find. And that includes here in Paris, but it also includes, you know, like the movie The Beach made Maya Beach in Kopi Pilei over tourists so they had to close it. But I was in Sumatra this winter, which used to be a part of the backpacker trail and has somehow fallen off the backpacker trail. And so there's an iteration of the beach in other beaches nearby. It's just nobody's going there because they're not on their bucket list. Because why? Because they don't know about them yet. So the bucket list should get you out the door. Once they're on the road, be willing to throw away those famous places and go to a place that is more amazing than you could have dreamt about when you woke up in the morning at home. I agree. Sometimes life is more creative than we are when it comes to the most amazing destination. At its best, life is more creative than we are. Yeah. That's the joy of life is that it, it exceeds our expectations if we let it. Yeah. Well, okay. One more question before I let you go. We, uh, we, the world, anyone who's read any of your writing and any of your books associates you with 
with travel and I'm sure you do as well I mean all of us who have traveled a lot we it's a part of our identity and like who we are but I'm just curious if you could share with us something that people don't know about you because Rolf and travel or Rolf and Tim Ferriss and these things kind of go together and when you're not traveling or writing what is like your personal life like or what are some of the other things that you like to do that aren't part of your public persona what's funny um like I like sports I've always watched sports my whole life and in fact when I sewed those international flags it was because of the Olympics Mm -hmm. but my favorite team is the can baseball team is the Kansas City Royals and a few years ago they got really good and so I started posting baseball stuff on my Facebook feed and people got kind of mad it's like (laughs) We don't want baseball stuff. What? Where's your travel stuff? And it's like, hey, I have a, I have a life that goes beyond travel, right? Yeah. So screenwriting is something that really interests me. I actually wrote a screenplay about baseball a few years ago that has, you know, it hasn't been produced, but it's been fairly successful in that non-produced way. I spend a lot of time with my family in, in very simple ways that everybody spends with their family. I've, I've been a part of my nephew's life. Of course, I give them travel presents um, when I can. Uh, and I think if you listen to my podcast, Deviate with Rolf Potts, the reason I called it Deviate is sort of maybe through midlife crisis uh, energy. I just wanted an excuse to talk about anything else, right? So I talk a lot about travel on my podcast, but I also talk about satanic backward masking and rock and roll and end of life quality of life and sustainable agriculture and um, the joys of philosophy. And so... I think as travelers, we are all just curious in the world. There's a meta level of being excited about travel, but one joy of travel is it allows you to be a generalist. It allows you to be interested and passionate about everything. And so, um, yeah, how many hours did you have? We could talk about everything that I get excited about from sports to family to to movies. And that's part of the point, you know, that I like talking about travel, but I also like a a lot of other things. So. I like what you just said, though. That I, th- I think that was great. Good. Um, so everybody out there, thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Badass Digital Nomads with one of the original lifestyle designers, the vagabonding Rolf Potts. And remember that Rolf is more than a traveler. <laughs> he also likes baseball and many other things. So I hope that this podcast has inspired you guys to integrate travel more into your life and think about ways that you can do that long term without changing who you are. Just make it more of an extension of your own individuality. So thank you guys for watching and see you next week on Badass Digital Nomads. Rock and roll. I get lots of like microphone comments. People are like, can I be your microphone? Not that yeah. I'm suggesting you do that, but sometimes when I edit my own podcast, the conversation will go on for 10 more minutes, but somebody says something so perfect. That yeah. Like, I'm just going to end it there. I hope that this podcast has inspired you guys to integrate travel 